Hello, I'm CJ Wellerman. Don't forget to subscribe to our show. Now let's get into it. In this episode, you're going to see what happens when vicious Islam haters get an opportunity to meet with Muslims for the very first time in their lives. It will reveal whether the Islamophobic bigotry of Trump and Modi supporters stands up to the cold, hard test of reality. Statistic after statistic has shown that Americans that have actually sat with Muslims and known them on a human level are very, very, you know, unlikely to hold these types of views about Muslims and things of that sort. In a moment, I'm going to share with you some stunning real life examples of Muslim haters becoming Muslim allies in an instant after meeting face to face with Muslims. But I just want to trace back to the clip you just watched, because what Omar Suleiman said cuts through and clarifies why Muslim minorities in America, India, Europe and elsewhere are subjected to majoritarian discrimination and abuse in the media public and political domain. The key word here being unfamiliarity. For instance, 67% of Trump supporters claim to hate Muslims. But, and this is remarkable, more than 85% of Trump supporters have never knowingly met a single Muslim person. This extraordinary gap between perception and reality could not be further apart, which means the hatred Trump supporters have for Muslims is based exclusively on what Trump says about Islam. You have people coming out of mosques with hatred and with death in their, in their eyes and, and on their minds. We're going to have to do something. They're trying to take over our children and convince them how wonderful ISIS is and how wonderful Islam is. And we don't know what's happening. And we have to look at the Muslims and we have to do something. Trump's hateful rhetoric has not only tripled the growth of anti-Muslim hate groups in the United States, but also sent the number of anti-Muslim hate crimes soaring upwards. And the more hateful stuff Trump spews at Muslims, the more his supporters want to hear more of it. Which was why he's vowed to reinstate his Muslim ban if he's elected to the White House again. Donald Trump is now saying Muslims should not be allowed to enter this country until the U.S. figures out what's going on. Do you agree with that? Yes, I do. Why? I don't want them here. Who knows what they're going to bring into this country? We got bombs, ISIS, what? They need to go. I think it's a good idea with everything that's going on in the world right now. I mean, it, it sounds harsh, but reality's reality. I can guarantee that not a single person you just saw in that clip and not a guy standing here have ever met a Muslim, read the Quran or stepped foot inside a mosque. They hate Muslims because Trump and the media told them so. Okay, so let's now introduce the rubber to the road and see what happens when these Trump supporters actually meet and get to know a Muslim. And I have several case studies here to show you. But we start with this Trump fan. His name is Joe, and standing next to him is Amina. She's an Iraq-born American. One of the things I liked about Trump was his hardline stance on immigration. I didn't think that Muslims and Americans could coexist. I thought Muslims were too radicalized. Joe and Amina met in unusual and extraordinary circumstances. They met at an anti-Trump rally, where Joe was attacked by far-left activists. This is where it happened, surrounded by Antifa. I noticed a guy standing over there, obviously a Trump supporter. These guys just swarmed me. I saw them grab his hat. Next thing I know, there's this tiny Muslim lady standing between me and Antifa, demanding that they back off. As someone who has had people try to rip my hijab off my head, something snapped inside me. That was the night I met Amina. That was the night that I met Joe. Amina and Joe stayed in touch since the night they first met, and in doing so have formed a lasting friendship, which has helped dispel the lies and misconceptions Joe previously held about Muslims. Did you feel threatened by Islam as a religion? A lot. Very, very threatened. Before meeting you, I believe that Islam was this violent, hateful religion, that there was no difference between ISIS and uh, the Muslim faith. When you stepped in that night at the rally, you were my bridge between catastrophe and enlightenment. It was gonna turn violent. And because of your actions, I really learned something about myself. And that's that if we don't see ourselves in other people, we can never grow as a nation. It becomes you versus me as opposed to us. But before we go on, we urgently need your help to counter injustices in the Muslim world. And we can't continue this effort without you. 
So please consider supporting my journalism at patreon.com slash cjwellerman. Our program is made possible only because of the support we receive from our wonderful patrons. Please join them in helping me bring these stories to a wider audience. Thank you. Now back to our show. It really is something special when you see an Islam hater's bigotry wash away when confronted with the kind of decency, compassion and humanity that Muslim minorities display towards their fellow citizens in their day-to-day -day lives. In saving Joe from a mob, Amina was simply following the orders commanded by her Islamic faith. Instructions for compassion, kindness and charity are prescribed throughout the Quran. Islam's holy book also guides Muslims to engage in reconciliation rather than revenge or retaliation. And God commands Muslims to open dialogue and find common ground with their enemies to avoid conflict, which is exactly what these Palestinian Americans did when they welcomed two Trump supporters to their restaurant in Anaheim, California. Why are you guys voting for Donald Trump? <laughs> I think he'd be good for the economy. You don't think um, his anti-Mexican, anti-Muslim, anti-Arab rhetoric hurts our country? I think a lot of that is uh, all talk. I don't think he would be like that so much once he was in office. You don't think we fear that, though? I thought he was just saying those things maybe to get votes. If we have to say that to get votes in this country, that's terrible. Well, then, I mean... It, it, but, wait a minute. It may be so, but it's worked. I mean... You gotta admit that's work. It's worked, right? Right. It's making it oh, okay. okay to be racist. It's making racism mainstream. It's like a few weeks ago we had a KKK rally. When was the last time you heard about that here in Anna? I mean, I... we we don't need to be divided. I He's agree. dividing so us. I think talking to you is giving me something to think about. The bearded Trump supporter is then invited to the home of an Arab community organizer in Los Angeles, where he sees for the first time how Muslim Americans live their daily lives no differently than Christian Americans. Hello. Oh, hello. Hi. I'm Daniel. Hey, Daniel. Murad. Murad. Nice, nice to meet you. you. It's my wife, Asma. Asma. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Morning. Thanks. This is my mother-in-law. Hi. This hello. is uh, Daniel. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. This is Daniel. You want to say hi? Shake hands. Hello. <laughs> This is the first time I've ever been to a uh, Muslim's house. A lot like my house would be. So yeah. Of course, things written in Arabic. Yeah. Um, are those prayers do you put up on the wall? or? Those are, um, they're different things. Some of them are verses from the Quran. Some of them were um, the, the, name, the name of God written in, in different calligraphy. He then asks the question that sits at the forefront of every Trump supporter's mind, and he receives the perfect answer. How does America tell a part of a good person like you versus a, an extremist that would, you know, blow themselves up? How, how do we separate? How do we tell? How do we separate that? How can I tell the difference between, between a, a white American who will sit down and have tea with me and one who, you know, won't have a problem killing me if he has an opportunity? Yeah, I, yeah you know there isn't any way. There, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. My wife walks around with a headscarf publicly. So if there's, she's at the store shopping and then somebody hears this rhetoric and then sees my wife walking around with a headscarf and she thinks that, oh, well, you know, I don't know who she is. She might be a terrorist. She might not be a terrorist. I'm not going to take any chances. Let me go do this to her. Let me go do that, do that to her. Yeah, that's a real concern. I, I understand that. I yeah. appreciate someone to protect their family. I, <clears throat> I do understand that. Yeah. The Muslim man makes such a great point. Given white domestic terrorism from far-right extremists, constitutes a far greater threat to U.S. national security than so-called Islamic extremists. But you never see Muslims accusing every white Christian of being a potential terrorist. It's reason and logic like this that evaporates anti-Islam narratives, which is why this former Islam-hating Trump supporter now has a much more open mind towards Muslims. Yeah, I can honestly say I'm not as decided as I was before. I'm a little undecided now. I'm not the kind of person who wants to hurt anybody. And I, meeting, meeting people has really given me a lot to think about. Meeting Muslim people, hearing their concerns. It's really made me, uh, given me a lot to think about. That's very beautiful to hear. All right, well, thank you. This next case study features a member of one of the most notorious anti-Muslim groups in the United States today. Here's its spokesperson. As a resistance against radical Islam, uh, coming to America and, and killing innocent American people. Uh, we're pre protecting our way of life, the Constitution. We're protecting all of it, everything. Everything that you know and understand about America. Now watch what happens 
when one of his foot soldiers meets with a Syrian refugee family in Texas. This little girl, Hanin, was actually in her living room when a bomb fell on top of her. She had her leg taken away from her leg. She's, she's just a little girl. I mean, when I was when I was five, I wasn't worried about his bomb or mortar going to hit my home. I mean, it kind of puts into perspective the reality of, of, of these types of situations. I'm willing to walk away uh, reconsidering that, that it's not all Islam. When I see something like that little girl, it's hard to say no. If that little girl was looking at me saying, please let me into America, I want, I want to escape this war. I, I, I would be unable to tell her no, that that's, I, I mean, you'd have to be heartless to. What you just saw was someone who not only hated Muslims from afar, but also wanted to harm them only to have a total change of heart of the seeing the humanity of Syrian refugees up close and personal. Demonstrating how empathy for a stranger can't be taught, it must be lived. This is why community and religious leaders who bring people together, an open dialogue between Muslims and non-Muslims plays such an integral part in our societies. Because it's through their work that positive change happens and Islamophobia ends. Last year, a Christian pastor hosted a discussion between a Muslim-hating Trump supporter and Syrian refugees who fled the Syrian dictator for the United States in 2013. I would speak with Mr. John Trump. I want to tell him one thing. That uh, he wants to ban all Muslim people. Islam means, it means peace. Our religion means peace. So our Quran doesn't have anything about killing people or killing anyone or being a terrorist. But the Trump supporter parrots what he has heard from Trump and the media about Muslims. It's a certain segment of your religion that they refer to as radical Islam. I've heard that name, ISIS. I've heard that name. I've heard Taliban. I've heard all these names that um, we have been told by the news medias here and the politicians and others that they're out to harm the West. This is where the Christian pastor, using his wisdom and faith, interjects to summarize why political hate speech against Muslims is not only totally inaccurate, but also highly dangerous. Statements made on a political framework to a large, broad population need to be weighed very, very, very carefully uh, because they have an impact for, for a long, long time. What he has said and what Donald Trump has said and other politicians are saying will never go away. Once those words are released around the world, they have an impact on the soul of every person that hears them. And I would say the man was a fool. I don't know. As we have claimed many times in this program, Islamophobia is a disease of the mind, and it's typically contracted by those who have never met Muslims, and have been instead exposed to negative stereotypes about Islam in the media and political domain. The cure to this disease is simple. Visit your local mosque and meet Muslims in your area. And while you're there, learn the basic tenets of the Quran and the biography of the Prophet Muhammad. It certainly cured my Islamophobia 13 years ago and it will do the same for you. I can guarantee it. So what are you waiting for? Anyway, that's my time for today. Please don't forget to subscribe to this channel and we kindly ask you please support our effort to expose and confront injustices in the Muslim world by becoming a member of this show at patreon.com slash cjwellerman. We can't produce, sustain and grow the show without your help. We offer exclusive benefits to those who do. For now, good night, good morning, wherever you are, and stay blessed. Thank you.